Please Till Dawn continue on Channel 5 with Island of Lost Souls. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating, always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. So here's a conversation that I had with Harold Becker, who is a master filmmaker. He's made a number of films uh, that you've heard of. They're household name movies like Sea of Love or Malice, or The Onion Field. Onion Field is certainly one of the best movies about the police ever made. Uh, Taps made a terrific military hostage drama, uh, and it introduced the world to Sean Penn and Tom Cruise. You could actually, you could say that Harold's the person who truly gave Tom Cruise his start, and he talks about that uh, amazing chapter uh, and, and how that happened in, in this conversation we have. Sea of Love, I think, is, you know, it, uh, it is a beyond a genre piece. It's, it's a great thriller, but it's also, as Harold points out, a love story, and we talk about that. And, of course, it's, it stars Al Pacino uh, and Ellen Barkin, and Pacino is really kind of Hal's, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would say they are, uh, as collaborators, you know, as close as an actor and a director uh, can really be. And then there's Malice, the, the aforementioned Malice, with Alec Baldwin and Nicole Kidman. And it's, of course, highly appreciated for Aaron Sorkin's script, but for Harold's taut and beautifully crafted direction as well. Um, there's another thing, though, that, that, that uh, has to do with Mouse, and it's that Harold belongs to a very elite club of directors who have made a movie that has one of the most classic lines ever in the history of cinema. Uh, now I've already told you it has something to do with malice. You probably know what it is, but I'm not going to tell you it. We we discuss it. Um, it's kind of a, a cool club to belong to. I mean, to have that on on, on your you know on your CV. Uh, how many directors can say I've directed a movie with one of the most famous lines? So let's see. In Casablanca, there's quite a few. There's Play It Sam, and we'll always have Paris. And uh, now the director of Casablanca, Michael Cortez apparently didn't speak English all that well. So he may not have realized that, for all I know, that he that he probably has more lines in that movie than any other director. Billy Wilder, of course, comes to mind because of uh, Sunset Boulevard. Uh, I am big. It's the pictures that got small, and we had faces then. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of those lines in Wilder. But it's a small club. I would love to – maybe this should be a little parlor game. Uh, that we could all play on dark, cold winter nights. What are the movies with the most famous lines? And Harold's got one of them. Anyway, beyond that, Harold's got a lot more than that. Um, He's really an actor's director, I I think, in in an extraordinary way, because performances are always incredibly strong in his movies, and they're nuanced. Um, And that's what a real actor does. He gives the actors the, the room to find more than it's just the surface of the character that's there. And I think the real proof of when a director is an actor's director is that great actors come back and work with them twice. Um, and notably James Woods, uh, you know, they made, they made a movie called The Boost, which is a, a really interesting 1980s uh, drug addiction drama, um, as well as The Onion Field. And, you know, uh, Pacino. I mean, that, that's like I said, it's a major collaboration, Sea of Love, um, and a really good movie called City Hall. Um, that I recommend to you. I, I, and, and apparently quite a few others that got away, alas. Um, but he talks about that cl- collaboration during this, this conversation. Harold started as a photographer uh, and in advertising, and then he moved into being a really, really successful TV commercial director in the 60s and 70s when that form was really becoming an art form in its, in its own way. Um, but during all that time, he was influenced by new wave cinema, um, and he was always looking for a way into the in, into both mainstream independent filmmaking first, and then ultimately mainstream. But it's an interesting set of influences that he has. And again, he talks about it uh, in in this conversation. Um, his photography is still very much a part of his life, and I highly recommend you go to his site, Harold Becker dot photography, um, and there you'll find really beautiful pictures of impressions of Greece and Italy and New York and L.A., uh, 
he can make L.A. look beautiful. That's a great photographer, right? So before I play you this conversation, though, um, I just want to give it some context. This Now, I'm recording this intro in January 2021, but we recorded this interview on Saturday, March 7, 2020. Now, why is that date special? Well, unfortunately, it was one week exactly before a very different America, a very different world descended upon us. It was a week before the pandemic shut everything down. Um, and, and I specifically, I mean, it's funny, I remember we, we interviewed Harold at his beautiful mid-century house in Beverly Hills. Um, and there were three of us in a room, and the room wasn't that big, and we all shook hands, and we weren't wearing masks. And the, the word pandemic had not yet re-entered the vocabulary. It had been retired in 1918 or 19 or something. And social distancing wasn't a phrase. I mean, it really was a very different world. And the reason I relate it to this interview is because while we were setting up, Harold told me that he was going to get a a, a retrospective at the upcoming Tribeca Film Festival, and that Al Pacino was going to be introducing him in films. And, you know, it was an important thing to have a retrospective of your work. But he said, I don't think it's going to happen. I think they're going to cancel it because of this thing. You know, we didn't call it the virus yet even. It was just this thing out there. Uh, And I said, don't be silly. They're not going to cancel it. They can't cancel a film festival. People have to just move on with life. We just have to take precautions. I said, and Harold looked at me and he said, no, 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 I don't think you get it. They're canceling stuff. I mean, they haven't told me yet, but I'm pretty sure this is happening. And I said, look, I, I, I assure you, it, it's just not going to happen, Harold. And here's why Harold's a much smarter guy than me. After I said that, he looked at me and he said, you want to bet? Anyway, uh, <laughs> Having said that, now, now that now that you know Harold to be a realist and, and me to be merely an, an optimist and a foolish one, uh, let's listen to this conversation that I had in March of last year with Harold Becker. In the 60s. Right. I did, I was doing... Sh- Short films. But you were also a very successful photographer. Yeah, it gave me the money to do short films. Mm. Okay? Because you don't get paid for short films. If you look around this room, well, I have a few, you'll see all kinds of diplomas. They're beautiful. That's what you get for short films. Right. Okay? (laughs) It's nice. They send them to you. Listen, it was a time, the 60s were an unbelievable period. And I'm talking about excitement in every area. And I was just starting, I started to get into film. But I was able to, because I had my own studio. I had my own assistants and everything. So we were like a little group. I could make short films. The 60s were such an exciting time because you had in, you had all the foreign films coming in and you had art cinemas in New York, okay? You had Cinema One, Cinema Two. You had the, I think it was, I'm trying to remember, was it Rugoff? Somebody who was, and Walter Reed, they both, between them, they must have had about 14, 15 art theaters in New York. And the picture, the films were pouring in from Europe, from the Italian uh, new wave, the French, then the English, it all in succession. We were living on it, you know? It was a great period. We'd go to movies, we'd talk all night about it, last year in Marion Bad, what it meant, the whole thing. And at the same time, I was doing these short films. I didn't do that many of them, but most of them were 10, 12 minutes long or 15. And the cinemas would run the feature and they would run a short with it if you had one for them. And there was a distributor, Leo Dradfield, he's probably gone by now. Uh, And he distributed my short films and got them into the theaters. And one day, the Bleecker Street Cinema, they were running Children of Paradise. And they had the big marquee, Children of Paradise. And then they had Ache, Harold Becker. <laughs> I was blown away. You and Marcel Carnet yeah. in the same yeah. bill. Yeah. On the same bill, <laughs> right? <laughs> How they, great. Wait, and I'm going to the theater, because they hadn't started, and he's Leo, the distributor, 
He's standing there with the booker for the theater, and they're discussing, not short film, they're discussing sea changers. That's what they refer to these short films as, because before they got wise to the fact they could make more money just going to a blank screen and people going out to the concession, they would amuse you by running a short film between the main one. You know, if you came in before the main one, you got to see my film between the two feet. Hmm. <laughs> that, that gave me a perspective <laughs> on what it all meant. <laughs> Aside from which they didn't pay you for it. Right. They put your name on the thing. Anyway, that was the short. It's interesting, so, so, so because I was going to ask you, when did you start seeing features that made you want to direct that, features? Yeah. And it sounds like the new wave and the, that era. Oh, of course. Yeah. That, what you're looking for, the promised land, is feature films. That's what you're inspired by. I was inspired by short films. I wasn't, frankly, I, I love documentary, but I wasn't inspired by documentary. I was inspired by the work I was seeing. When I was looking at Antonio... This was um, my school. It was all of our school. Mm -hmm. We learned. That was our education, was looking at these films. Hmm. I look at, I can say Antonioni, when I saw La Ventura, it was seminal in my own understanding because I saw a visual director, a director who spoke through visuals. The Hollywood film, by and large, was based on the book. There were great directors here, William Wyler, but it was the writing that in other words, that was the foundation. It wasn't that the writing wasn't in these other films, but they wrote with cinema. There were some great directors like the John Ford, people like that, who I connected with. But I was a photographer at the time. I, I can't say I knew I'm a visual person. I, you know, you can't say things like that because you, you, that's the road you're on. But these films spoke to me. And... That was the common ground. And so when you say, did you want to make films? Of course, I, you know, I was at that point in my late 20s, early 30s. I th the world is yours. You could do anything. I was very successful as a photographer. I'd come, I didn't have a credit card when I started this in this business, so to speak. So you, you have this confidence that you, th you think you can do anything. And you know, sometimes you can. And sometimes you can't. Well, I tell you what, you do it for money, I'll do it for kicks. That way we'll both be satisfied. Fine, sounds reasonable. My name's Tony Bradmore, what's yours? It's where I live. You can take me to the cinema if you like. Tomorrow, five corners at eight. What's your name? Doris. My name's Doris. Originally, my dream was that I wasn't going to go to, I wasn't going to Hollywood. That wasn't ever my ambition. Mm. I was going to go to Europe to make films, to England. I made my first feature in England, 71, I was, I did it between 69 and 71. It was released in 71, 72. I already was starting my second feature over there when the bottom dropped out of the market. In other words, there was a recession in England and all of a sudden, film became, or well, for me, something that I couldn't get done. That's when I came back to this country. And I thought, I thought Ragman's Daughter was going to open doors. It didn't open doors. The reason it didn't open doors, it was not a commercial success. I didn't understand then the important thing. I thought the important thing, I, it was at a time I had done, I was doing a lot of commercials. They had supported me. And they also, I put my own money into Ragman's Daughter. Mm. Okay? I had investors. Not, no, no news to you. Half of them dropped out before they signed a check. But my point is, we went to Venice with the film. We won the Giovanni Award. That was the best first film. It's up there on the wall. And I thought, this is the door opening. Well, it didn't open with that. Mm. The door opened for me with The Onion Field. I actually was not ever going to go to Hollywood. I was arrogant, I guess, or whatever. I had loved European movies. I didn't see, I thought of Hollywood as a closed door. When I did my first film, Redman's Daughter, I had a wonderful cinematographer, Michael Saracen. We were good friends, but he had never done a film. I had never done a feature film. We, both, we met doing commercials. 
But I, when I did commercials, especially here, I was my own cinematographer. What else was I going to do? As a photographer, went into your thing, you went into them, you filmed them. To me, it was a luxury bringing them. Only when I went to England did I start using cinematographers. It was a luxury to use a cinematographer. It was less work for me, but I was always ready to stand by their side and talk about the lighting and everything. That was my thing. Lighting, not performance. And first day, I have two young actors, Victoria Tennant and Simon Rouse. And we go, first day of shooting, I'm out there with them, and I'm with Michael, who's a great cinematographer. Even then he was. And, but I'm doing the lighting with him. I looked at the rushes and I realized something. I shouldn't be out here. I should be in the dressing room with the kids. Okay? That was my first lesson, mm -hmm. that that's where I belong. I belong with the actors. Mm -hmm. That get great people to do the work on a thing. Yes, it's your visual thing, but you, you want to depend on other people to do certain parts of it and give them the chance to do what they can do. Chuck Rocha did the onion field for me. And he did a great job having no money. There were the lighting. I mean, you, you need a budget for lighting. You need a budget for all of these things. We work, as I said, we are working with PARs to light a, a whole onion field. But he did a great job for me. So you were able to step back fairly early on and say, this is not the director I want to be. I don't want to be the control, controlling the, the be. photography. The, yeah. Well, I am controlling it in a way. I worked very closely with him. I tried on almost every film at lunch hour to have lunch with the cinematographer so we could sit and talk. So it's a close relationship, but I'm not telling him what to do, nor, nor am I telling the actors what to do. Mm -hmm. I've had great luck with cinematographers. I've chosen very good cinematographers, and I have had a, uh, the important thing, a rapport with them. I understood their world to some mm -hmm. degree and respected it, uh, more important. I knew when they needed time for things, and I gave them time, and I, I know how to structure it. I learned a lot from cinematographers, because they had worked with other, they worked with some great directors. Uh, when I worked with, say, uh, Ro Rocha, uh, Chuck Rocha, he had worked with uh, Altman. He had done two or three pictures with Altman. When I worked with Roisman, he had done pictures with Sidney Pollack, with all these people. So, I was already, I got clued in a lot to how they handled things. Any cop who gives up his gun to some punk is a coward. He's got a gun in my back. Give him yours, Carl. 9 p.m. Los Angeles, California. Petty criminals Greg Powell and Jimmy Smith force police officers Ian Campbell and Carl Hedinger to an abandoned onion field. I told you we were going to let you go, but have you ever heard of the Little Lindbergh Law? Do you know what the Lindbergh Law is? The kidnapping carries capital punishment. You're wrong. Up until the moment the first shot was fired, the Little Lindbergh Law didn't apply. I'm just a thief! I'm the cop killer! Why the hell would I lie? What could I gain? You can stand silent on the Fifth Amendment. John Savage is Officer Carl Hedinger. Ted Danson is Officer Ian Campbell. James Woods, the actor, portrays Greg Powell, the criminal. Franklin Seals, the actor, portrays Jimmy Smith, the criminal. The book is a bestseller. The screenplay is by the author. We have now seen what the onion field looked like on the night of March 9th. What happened in the onion field is true, but the real crime is what happened after. Joseph Wombaugh's The Onion Field. A true story. Coming from Avco Embassy Pictures. I kind of feel if there's one person I owe a great deal to, I owe things to a lot of people. At the beginning, it was Joe Wambaugh. 
Shambhala, Joe Wambo wrote The Onion Field. And I came out here. I didn't even want an agent. That's how crazy I was. I wasn't going to get a Hollywood agent. And a, I had a friend, How, Howard Zeef, who also did commercials, and he was also breaking into film. And Rhonda was his girlfriend, and she was an agent, a good agent. And she, she said, Harold, let me represent you. What have you got to lose? I was in, staying in hotels here because I was doing commercials out here. And sure enough, there was a, I forget his first name, R Rosenberg, or the agency. It was Adams, Ray, and Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. He was one of the heads of the agency. He calls me one day, so I'm represented by that agency. And he says, uh, I have uh, Joe Wambau here. He's interested. He's got a film he wants to make. Can I send you the script? It's The Onion Field. I was not somebody who was very connected with cops. In New York, we have a diff different attitude that way. And I was not familiar with Joe Wamba. I knew he was best-selling. He'd done the Choir Boys, the, these other major breakthroughs from television and film. He had come up there for a different director. That other director was busy. So he said, take a look at the Ragman's Daughter. Why he connected me with the Rag... Now, the Ragman's Daughter has a story about a love affair between a girl and a thief, but has about as much to do with a gritty... Isn't that interesting, though, that he... Uh, well... But he saw something. Yeah. Okay. Did you ever ask him what it was exactly? No, I never asked him. <laughs> and I was supposed to meet him, him and his wife, Dee. I love both of them. They lived in San Marino. I was staying in a hotel here in... Uh, I may have been the Beverly Hills or whatever. And we arranged to meet. I had read the script. When I read the script, I called, I think his name was Lee, Lee Rosenberg. And I said, I don't think we're going to have this meeting. He says, why? I said, there's two movies here. The first half is a crime melodrama. The half, second half is a courtroom drama. It's never going to work. <laughs> and he said these famous words to me. He said, Harold, have you got something better to do? <laughs> so I went and met them, and Joe said something to me, which stayed with me, and was a turning point for me. And he said, if I was born to do one thing, it was to write this book. Mm. Well, you can't get past the passion like that. You attach yourself to it. But even when we made the film, we were making the film, he said something to me at the beginning. He said, Harold, he raised all the money himself. And the reason he raised the money, he had had a bad experience with the studios on another film. I think The Choir Boys. The Choir Boys, yeah. so you know the story. He had a bad experience. They had lied to him, etc. They had finally, they had to pay him off because they had a contract with him which required them to get his okay for any changes in the script. They went and they rewrote the script. They rewrote the script and they swore the entire cast to secrecy. How, lo how long do you think that lasted? Yeah, it was going to, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it was a completely independent film. So a completely independent field. film, and that's yeah. the only way Joe wanted to do it. He wanted to stick. But all he could raise, which was a lot of money for somebody who didn't have money himself. I mean, he, he was he was not wealthy, but he was well off from the books and everything. But he didn't have money to finance. Even we're talking about the 70s. $2 million was still a lot of money. Still not a lot of money today if you could try to raise it. And he raised $2.2 .2 million, I remember. And he said to me, Harold, you're not going to have enough money to do this film, but you're going to have more freedom than you'll ever have again in this business. Hmm. And he was right. Yeah. He was the dream producer. He didn't want to produce a credit, but he was really a producer. And he said, I would no more think of telling you what to do than I would have you tell me what to do. There was one, only one thing in the contract with him. And it was a verbal contract. I didn't sign anything. And that is, I wouldn't change a word without talking to him about it. And he was on the set with me. I was going to say, so he must have been oh, yeah, really young. Uh... Yeah. And so, but when we made the film, if you said to me at that point, what do you think? I, I'd have no idea. It was just a long struggle. We did, it was like a joke, we did 21 days and 21 nights. Well, oh. You know, there's 21 nights in that. You know how difficult it is on a budget to do that? 
we didn't have. We're shooting in the onion field and we're using pars to light the onion field. <laughs> They're laying them down on, on the thing. We didn't have big overhead Wendy's. Right. You know, no, you, you crank up a few Wendy's and you've got beautiful moonlight. Sure. But we didn't have any of those things and it all worked. It was people got involved in that film. They cared. Joseph Wombaugh's The Onion Field, The Praise, is just beginning. Us Magazine says The Onion Field is a deeply moving masterpiece, one of the year's best films and a likely Academy Award contender. Rex Reed acclaims The Onion Field as a scalding police dossier that goes deeper than just telling a good story. It has a shattering effect. And After Dark calls The Onion Field a brilliant thriller, engrossing and provocative. The Onion Field, a true story from Avco Embassy Pictures. I remember going in one day in the courtroom scene, and someone in the crew had written on one of the bounce boards, shoot the movie, not the budget. Like reminding me, right. because we were pushing everything. And now we get back to uh, Jimmy. I couldn't have asked for uh, an actor that was more supportive because he was quick. We're shooting once in a, the, uh, in a, um, the pawn, a pawn shop. That's where he buys a gun for Jimmy Smith, for Franklin. They go, they go into the pawn shop and he's at the counter and he reaches in his pocket. I'm shooting a scene. He forgot the prop man had forgotten to give him, put the money in his pocket. So he reaches in the pocket, there's no money. He says, don't, don't keep the camera rolling. Ran out of the set, grabbed the money, came back and picked it up right there. <laughs> okay? That's how quick he was. And because not only was he, he was being supportive, he knew how pressed we were for time and everything. I finish a cut of the film. Call it a final cut. And because Joe is my partner, I show it to him. I don't have any effects in the film. When a car's going around the turn, it looks like it's going five miles an hour instead of 50 because I don't have any effects in it. Unbeknownst to me, he gets so excited about the movie. The one thing you knew when you saw that, you know how you look at a film when it's done? There's two things. Does it work or doesn't it? You know, And if it doesn't work, all of a sudden you're in trouble. You're trying to figure out how I'm going to make it work. This one worked. Okay, By that you mean the momentum's there, the story's there. People look, you get caught up in it. Mm. Okay, and you watch it through from beginning to end. Whether they're gonna enjoy it or not, that you don't know. But what Joe does, he calls up, he had relationships with all the studios. He called up Paramount, Columbia, Warners, Universal, four major studios. And he comes back and he says, I've got screenings on Tuesday at these two and on Thursday at the other two, morning and afternoon. I said, Joe, we don't have effects in, we don't have music in. He says, Aaron, don't worry about it. This thing works. By Friday, we had a rejection from all four studios. Oh, no. Okay? <laughs> all of a sudden, we're scrambling. We don't have a distributor. And that's when AFCO Embassy, an independent distributor, who ended up, by the way, interestingly enough, if you want to go into the future, AFCO Embassy em ended up as Embassy. Embassy ended up as Castle Rock. The point is that I'm in New York. I'm still living in New York. I'm not, I haven't moved out here. We open up at the Murray Hill. It's probably not there anymore. It's right on 34th Street. It's about a block, um, a block west of 3rd Avenue. This was like an art theater. And we're look, we're opening up there. We're opening up in the Afco Embassy. I think the only thing, they didn't give them any money. Oh, Joe owned the film. He gave me a, he gave, he was generous. He gave me a piece, but most of it belonged to his investors. They had put in, so each one got 10%, 5%. Anyway, I don't go into that. Embassy agreed, Afco Embassy, to spend a million dollars on prints and advertising. Total. They guaranteed a million dollars. The ad in New York papers was an eighth of a page. You don't know how small that is, okay? Or how expensive, given it was a New York like, Times ad. Yeah. That's right. Of course, I didn't. Really, I didn't know anything about all that. I didn't. Those things didn't concern me. But you know, um, amusement advertising, film advertising, all that. 
is about 10 times as expensive, a full page for your movie is as ex- 10 times as expensive as a full page for Bloomingdale's. Hmm. That's how they make their money right. on uh, the entertainment section of the paper. So they got a little eight, one eighth of a page, a little black and white, practically an announcement. And somebody had told me, well, when you open a movie, go to the first night, you got to be there. Okay, I show up, and there's a line around the block. Don't ask me, because it's a, a lesson in something. Because I've had films that had a lot of advertising and didn't have a line around the block. Yeah. Somehow it had a word of mouth. Now, I'm not saying it ended up a blockbuster. No, but, but it, it was, it's a, it's it was a famous film, though. It, why, why do you think, what do you think appealed in the, in the, in the zeitgeist at that I moment? I don't know. I can't tell you. I could tell you another amusing story. Sure. Before that film gets released, because we don't expect anyone to come to see it. We have no expectations for the film. We did what we wanted to do. That's all we could say. And we went our, our own way. Joe has written another script based on another book of his called The Black Marble. It's a black comedy. He comes to me, this is months before the film, oh, six months before the film is going to be in the theaters, before the onion film is going to be in the theaters. And he says, Harold, I got another film for you. If you like this script, we can, I'll get the money for it. And I promise you, we're going to make mo- make back on this the money we're going to lose on the onion field. Okay? And we go ahead and we make it. And we made a good film. It had Harry, Harry Dean Stanton. It had, oh, I won't go into it all. But I've, I've seen Blackmore. It's very, it's charming. It's charming. Yeah. It's a good, bla- it's more than charming. Uh, so to me, that's not enough. Because <laughs> it's got the best reviews I've ever gotten on a movie. Yeah. You know, when they do that media, we got like 90 something percent. When I was doing Taps, I'm in Philadelphia. They had the guy Philadelphia Inquirer or whatever. They had done, they had liked the Black Marble so much, they had given it a double page spread, color spread in the Sunday paper. And the film closed on Sunday. See, he was pissed <laughs> off when he saw me. But my point is, I learned there's an adage that black comedies open on Friday and close on Sunday. Well, we proved it. It's, <laughs> still, it's still a good movie. Yeah. But who, nobody is. Hardly anyone has seen it. I'm surprised you saw it. So you come from, obviously you come from photography, you do commercials. You to me are very much, and I don't think I'm alone in thinking this, very much an actor's director. How did that, what, what was your feeling when you started working with actors? And how have you, you know, I don't know. Yeah. very strong performances in every yeah. one of your films. Uh, well, and a lot of relationships with maybe, the same actors, which you know, always is a maybe, good thing. Maybe if you're having, if, if it's new to you, if it's not something, I didn't come from theater. I didn't come from working with actors. I worked with actors, of course, in commercial, but you don't count that in the same way. They were, but maybe you compensate for it by working harder at it, something like that. Or I, I had enormous regard for actors. Always did. I mean, even though I hadn't worked with them, I wasn't tone deaf. I was very, uh, as a person who went to the theater and everything, I was coming out of New York. I came out of a sophisticated world, you can say. By the time I got into film, because I didn't get into film when I was a kid, I got into I got into photography. So, but I was going to the theater. I was going to Off Broadway. I was going to see the uh, I forget their name now. Who did the Connection and the, the Living Theater and all that. I saw Al Pacino in 1967 when he did The Indian Wants the Bronx. Mm. So I'm saying I was into all of those sure. things. That, that doesn't mean I'm not saying by magic it rubs off because you went to the theater that you can direct actors or something mm-hmm. like that. I just had enormous reverence for him. I also a great believer in rehearsals, in working. Do you rehearse before the shoot starts? Oh yeah, but that's a thing that's gone by the way. Mm-hmm. I, it's, it's, I think, a terrible it's not a mistake. It's the reality of the time. People don't. They people, even actors, not to their credit, or it's their agents. They'll book a picture, and say it's eight weeks, and you say eight weeks plus two weeks rehearsal. Oh no. Eight weeks. He may have something backing up to it, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. In other words, they're not even giving you rehearsal time. They don't want. Maybe if you paid them, they'd give it to you. 
But I feel like the actors want it, though. That that you're, it's not them that they that they're doing it. But the big thing that's doing it is the budget. That's the big thing. Yeah. People, and then you had people, and he's a great director, Clint Eastwood. People didn't believe in. You know, there are directors don't believe in. They think it's more spontaneous the other way. Well, I always thought, I, I don't need to rehearse where you're sitting. That we're going to learn as we go along, or how you move around. I don't block. I don't do that kind of rehearsing. I just want to get us familiar with each other. I'll tell you, I'm learning as I'm doing the rehearsal. We're all learning something because all of us, I think it's really rough, especially even when I'm working with actors who come in four weeks later, I'd like them to be at the rehearsal so they know where they fit in. And if they can't get at the rehearsal, then I'm going to hopefully spend a weekend excuse me, prior to shooting, you don't want someone coming cold on a day of shooting and we all we don't know each other. So even on that level, you can call that all rehearsal. Mm -hmm. People get to know the material. And you got a writer there too. And he's hearing it. You can see how valuable it all is. Sure. You know. Informed that Bunker Hill Academy is to be closed. An end to nearly a century and a half of tradition and an end to the heart of us. Sir, how can they do this? With the stroke of a pen, sir. Their field of honor was a desktop. The lady said the proprietors ordered the school closed. Now, as I see it, we are the proprietors. You tell us where you put those weapons or this will be the sorriest day of your life. All right, we have three demands. They're very reasonable. When they're met, we'll be happy to return every weapon, every shell. You say we. Who else? Number one, I want a meeting with General Vance. Now your you back. stay where back. you are, Sheriff. Everyone in here is here because they want to be here. Our son would not be involved in something like this. Lady, if my son can be involved in it, your son can be involved in it. My men. Our tanks, our helicopters, we will take this campus. So anybody who isn't 100% sure of what we're doing, take one step forward. Attention! Oh, what? Oh, what? Major Mullen, he's our man. Major Mullen, he's our man. They don't scare us, do they, Charlie? No, sir. Me neither, sir. They don't scare me. What in God's name did they teach you in here? You and I have nothing more to talk about. Taps put me on the map in Hollywood. I meet with Stanley, Jeff. He said that was a heavyweight producer at the time. And Stanley calls up, has an interview with me, and he keeps me right in the room. I want you to direct I had already read the script, said I would like to do it. and But I had never done a major that they call major. I did independent pictures. My first three movies are independent movies. Can you handle a big budget, all the crap? They don't ask you that question, but that's in their mind and everything. What's really in their mind, I believe, I and mean, you can attest to this, what they're worried about in a director is, can they control you? They're gonna give you a lot of money. They wanna wake up and find out that this is a fucking disaster they have. You've spent, you're spending money out of control how do they control you? They don't want to replace you. That's a big problem, replacing you. Or if they're going to replace you, they're going to do it very early in the process. But anyway, Stanley, huh? that's a story about Stanley in the office. And Stanley gets, oh, what's his name? The head of, He was the head of, um, of Columbia at the time. He calls him up and says, I've got the director. I am only hearing my side of the conversation. And the other guy said, he says, what do you mean, who is he? <laughs> he did the onion field. You haven't seen it? 
Go see it. The other thing escalates. And he says, go fuck yourself. He says, we're moving. <laughs> Calls up Sherry Lansing. Says, we're moving to Fox. She had become the head of Fox. So we moved studios while I was standing in the room. <laughs> Have you ever had to replace anyone? Yeah. Yeah. That's how Tom Cruise got his job in... Um, Taps? Taps. Yeah. Well, you know that story. I don't. Oh. When we had... Taps was, of course, all young people. And I had cast... Timmy Hutton, of course, already had done Ordinary People. It hadn't come out yet, but I had already seen the picture. I knew I had talent here. Sean Penn, I found off an off-Broadway play. And it's his first I, film, I think. First film. Yeah. But he, I already saw a great actor. I think it was called Heartland. It had another actor in it, J.C. Quinn, who plays a uh, short order cook in Vision Quest. He's mar marvelous in it. But anyway, uh, I cast him. I cast an actor out of Tennessee. He was from Tennessee, I think, in Nashville. He was from a children's theater. He was a very talented kid, and I cast him for the part that ultimately is Tom Cruise in. Tom Cruise I had cast as an extra, as a sort of an extra who I was going to give lines to. I called it a cadre. I was going to surround my, what I did was I was surrounding my principals with a group of other cadets, actors, who were extras. But I thought guys I could give a line to here or there, okay? Because they were going to be living in the same barracks with uh, my actors. Tom was one of them. And the kid I had cast for the part was not cutting it. He didn't have the edge I needed. And I'm watching this kid on, this kid Tom Cruise, I'm watching him on the parade field because I've mixed my kids in. I'm shooting the picture out at a military academy, the Valley Forge Military Academy. And I had the advantage of going out there during the school year, starting our rehearsals, I was able to get the cadets from the real academy and integrate them so my kids were parading with them. I was able to have all these young kids become cadets at the school, okay? And I'm watching this kid out of the corner of my eye. Well, he's not yawning, but he's walking through walls. This kid, stood out. I said, that's my, that's the kid I'm looking for. Hmm. And I had a good, very good producer, Stanley Jaffe. I said, Stanley, I'm, we have to replace this kid. It's always tough. It's terrible. It has to be done. Anyway, and I say, I want to get this kid, Tom Cruise. I call Tom in, and I say, unfortunately, these kids all had become friends already. Of course, I had a very long rehearsal period. I think I had four, I think I, I asked for four or five weeks of rehearsal for that picture, and Stanley gave it to me. So we were well into it, so this kid, they were all together. They're staying at the same hotel, they were all, you know, they, and he says to me, he says, I can't do it. I can't take his part. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm sure that's the last time I'm gonna hear this. And I said, I'll tell you, Tom, I really respect what you're saying, because he was a very decent kid. I said, I, I respect it, but he's gone. He was gone. I wouldn't have started auditioning people before he had left. I said, he's gone already, and if you don't take the part, and I meant this, I'm going to have to go to New York, and we're going to cast this part. That's what we would have had to do. I would have had to run back to New York and start auditioning people. That's how I got Tom Cruise. We are going to have such a great year. It is going to be the best year yet. We are going to command the best regiment this school has ever seen. Damn well said. In honor of this auspicious occasion, Major Moreland, your presence is requested in the hallway. What I'd, lo I'd love to know if that was a film that you developed. Wambach came to you with the first two movies. That, yeah. uh, but but no, how did Taps I, come about? No, this one was already in development. I was brought in, and we started from scratch. We brought in a new writer, Daryl Ponixon, a wonderful writer. He'd written, and he'd written Cinderella Liberty, he'd written no novels. 
Ter- terrific writer. He wrote Vision Quest for me after that. But he's a great writer. And we brought him in. We started from page one, rewriting it, because it's based on a book. So you can say I was, I was in on development, of course. We developed a new script for it. Mm-hmm. That's my answer. And we had time. There was also a writer's strike took place. Was it an actor's strike? It was a strike that took place. On a couple of my films, there was a strike took place. See, I think it was an actor's strike. That's why we couldn't continue. I think a picture was supposed to start, I think, in the beginning of the summer, started in the fall, hmm. I think. Now, I have to ask you this because yeah. every director I, I meet who's worked with George C. Scott, one of my favorite actors ever, oh, but I have to George, ask you for a George C. Scott story. George C. Scott was great. Yeah. George C. Scott, the first time I met him was when he came in for his physical and to talk to me. You know, it's not somebody's going to audition or something like that. He loved the kids. He would be playing chess with Timmy. He was so supportive. A great, great actor. Mm. And of course, I was in awe of him. Kind of thing. I used him again, you know, of course. I used him again in, um, in, in, in Malice. Much later, and that was towards the end of his career. The power to heal can be an enormous thing. To save a life, to get blood flowing into cells. If a person can do that, such a person would think that he could do anything. The power to heal can be like a drug. Turns out that your hospital has a new surgeon, this whiz kid from Mass General. So I went back to introduce myself. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. We went to high school together. Ah, speak of the devil. And the devil appears. <laughs> I mean, he walks into the elevator and he thinks he's God's gift. What's your problem with this guy? I mean, he's smart, he's funny, and he's a brilliant doctor. We could even ask him to recommend another doctor for you. Please tell me you didn't say anything to Jed. Please tell me you didn't share my problems with him. What the hell are you doing in here? I can refill this prescription for you. Anybody home? Up here, honey. I'll tell you one thing. You go to the doctor. And they say, you know, you have to fill out that, that whole thing. And they fill in film director. And what films do you do? I learned, tell them, I did a film called Malice. They love Malice because yeah. Malice is about malpractice. It's about a crooked doctor. They love it. <laughs> All of a sudden, they're looking at you differently. Well, you Malice know. is also a film that, uh, I, I mean, it, ha- it, it it's memorably complex and beautifully crafted. It is beautifully crafted. Yeah. And I... How did I, that develop? Let's, we'll jump to Malice. I'd love to hear about uh, it because yeah. it's one of my favorite of your movies. Yeah, it, it's a very entertaining movie. It is a, what you call a genre movie. Uh, without putting it down, it's what people refer to as a classification, a B-movie. All movies that are plot-driven, I think in my mind that they're like, the key in a pl- plot-driven movie is to hide the plot. It's like Hitchcock, the MacGuffin. You hide the plot, and that's what makes it interesting to the audience. They're following one line, and bang, that's not what it is, it's another. And what I enjoyed in that movie was the con- constructing, maybe you call it constructing a better mousetrap, right? I had very good actors, and, but I knew going into the movie that everything depended upon building the pieces. Oh, I think now you're vastly overstating. Is that why you didn't give Dr. Hill the job? There were a number of other factors. Is that why you removed a healthy ovary without any scientific diagnosis? Don't you address my client, Mr. Riley. Do you have a God complex? This is not acceptable. No, no, let him address me. Jed? No, no, it's about time I got to give some answers here. Stop typing, this is off the record. The question is, do I have a God Dr. Kessler says yes. Which makes me wonder if this lawyer has any idea as to the kind of grades one has to receive in college to be accepted at a top medical school. 
If you have the vaguest clue as to how talented someone has to be to lead a surgical team. I have an MD from Harvard. I am board certified in cardiothoracic medicine and trauma surgery. I have been awarded citations from seven different medical boards in New England, and I am never, ever sick at sea. So I ask you, when someone goes into that chapel and they fall on their knees and they pray to God that their wife doesn't miscarry, or that their daughter doesn't bleed to death, or that their mother doesn't suffer acute neural trauma from post-operative shock, who do you think they're praying to? Now, go ahead and read your Bible, Dennis, and you go to your church, and with any luck, you might win the annual raffle, but if you're looking for God, he was in operating room number two on November 17th, and he doesn't like to be second-guessed. You ask me if I have a God complex? Let me tell you something. I am God. And this sideshow is over. That's a line that is as memorable as uh, play it again, Sam. Or the, it's a line that everyone knows. From That's the, right. Yeah. So when they're doing the trailers for it, they, they want to put that in there. And I'm fighting with them. I said, you can't put that in there. They'll give away the whole movie. Of course they put it in there. That it's, they were smart. It sold the movie mm -hmm. kind of thing. But the important thing I want to get to is that when you do a film like that, you have to get the pieces. You, you, you have no room for slack, for things to drop through. There's that one scene with Anne Bancroft. Now that's the Charlie the Explainer scene. And always the most difficult thing to do because that's going to reveal everything. And I had a very good writer. At that point, he wasn't as well known as now. Well, Aaron Sorkin. And he spent... That was the one scene that came in late. We didn't have it at the beginning. I kept on saying, when am I going to get that scene? And by the time he got it, he wrote it brilliantly because he folded it into a card game, into a card shark. Mm -hmm. He turned Ann Bancroft into a dealer. Now, Ann Bancroft, she's a great actress. I was so privileged to get her. And she had never played cards in her life. But to her credit... By the time I shot the scene, she was perfectly at ease with cards. I suffer him good. Bill and me used to give Tracy a little bit of the money each week so she could buy candy or lip. Shuffle the cards. She wouldn't spend it, though. Not a penny. Each week she put it under the mattress. I swear, I think that kid had maybe 200 bucks under the mattress. I'll tell you something else about Tracy. I don't think it bothered her a bit when her father cleaned out the bank accounts and disappeared. I think it bothered her when he took the $200 from under the mattress. Jesus, what the hell kind of family is this? You want to bet me a double C? What? 200 bucks. You want to give me 200 bucks? I know what your card is. I give you 200 bucks. I don't. No. Because once money's involved, you take me seriously, right? Look, you said there was a point here, and I Why think... Why do you I... give a Frenchman's fuck who she was sleeping with? Get into the game. Go for the 20 million yourself. Are you saying that Tracy set this up? What the hell have I been telling you? Am I talking to my shadow? You think you're Sherlock Holmes with this statue? You can buy him in any department store for $89.95. Looks just like the real thing. The whole thing was a setup? You're crazy. Yeah? Then how come I have the jacket clubs in my fucking pocket? It was a scene that maybe called for one day or two days. I gave it three days. I took my time with that scene to get it right. Because it is the child. If that scene bores you, the picture's finished. Right. Okay? You have to think, wow, when you come out of that scene. Because she's revealing what her daughter really is. Mm. To, it's very powerful, to, yeah. To her, to her husband. Yeah. yeah. But it took Anne Bancroft. But anyway, you get back. Those are performances. But it took the writing. See how he just, well, if you ever see the film or think about the film, he folded all of the explanation into the cards. Don't you move! Use your office! Drop it! 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 Drop it
I heard from one of you guys you caught a good one. Face down taxpayer back of the head in his own bed. Your guy put an ad in the singles magazine, right? There's some psycho woman out there killing guys. Wanna well, know how we catch her? We put our own ad in. We set up dates with 30, 40, 50 of the ladies who answer. We take them out, some restaurant, some bar, get their prints on a wine glass. Bingo, she's dropped. I don't believe in wasting time on this kind of stuff. You know what you know and you go with it. You go with what? I believe in animal attraction. I believe in love at first sight. I believe in this. No offense, but you never did get her prince, did you? She's not the shooter. I have done some desperate, foolish things. You mean like being here with me? Oh, you're a good man. You never know. You just met her. What are you looking for? Huh? She's a freaking suspect, Frank. Just walk away. This is getting out of hand. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? I knew that, lo that Sea of Love is a love story. It's not a murder mystery. The murder mystery is the MacGuffin. Okay? So you got to know where your priorities are. What makes the film is that it's a love story. It's this love story of Al falling in love with Alan. If that chemistry works, you got a movie. If it doesn't work, you know, what are you going to have? A story about a killer who's lurking and jumps in. First thing that happens in the movie, and happened in the script, the script had been sent to me years earlier. That script had been around for, I think, about four years. I'm sure, I never spoke to Cindy about it, but I'm sure we all had one thought. Something dirty about a woman who does personal ads. When I was younger, I used to look at the Village Voice, I'd look at their personal ads, and I think to myself, who, who could these people be? Who could respond to this? It was one step from going to a whorehouse. So I finishing Boost, I get a call, from Tom Pollock. Anyway, it's I mean, it's really Bregman, and they, would I be interested? Al Pacino. I had seen this thing, but with Al Pacino, I'm looking at it all differently. Somehow I know that with him, I'll be able to surmount this seedy part to this thing. In fact, there's a line in the film, you know, Richard Price addresses it directly. When they're already a couple, they're walking along. Uh, uh, this is done right here on what uh, street? I think it was on Broadway. We were shooting it on Upper Road, I mean, Broadway and around Seventy Second Street. And he turns to and he's talking about, and he says, "How could you do that?" He says, "But I was a cop, and it's a big explosion over there." Because he's still got in his mind that how can this girl that he's fallen in love with have been soliciting dates through the personal ads. I would like for the three of us, you know, to go somewhere, a movie or something. Just take it slow, you know. Helen, I can't even sleep in my own bed anymore unless you're in it. I mean, I need you to lie down with me. Otherwise, I'm just going to walk the streets all night. I'm so tired. You got to come lay down with me. Got these shoes here. Come back with me, please. Let me go tell my mother. 
What do you think your special we're, connection with Al Pacino is? We're artists. And we're both from New York. We're both from the Bronx. I think it goes deep. When we did the um, Sea of Love, there were four people in it involved in it who came from the Bronx. Marty Bregman, Richard Price, Al Pacino, and myself. Hmm. And we were all were, came from relatively poor backgrounds. We had an understanding of something that you don't learn any other way. So I believe uh, before Sea of Love, you were going to do another movie with Al Pacino called Johnny Handsome, which uh, I guess eventually got made with Mickey Rourke. Tell me about that. The story is of a man who transforms from being a grotesque into a handsome through the miracle of plastic surgery. I won't go into the details of it, but it's a whole story. And the name Johnny Handsome, of course, is an ironic name that's given to him in the underworld. Well, we decide to do a makeup test. We bring in the top makeup guy in Hollywood, one of the top ones, and Al, we get a hotel room, Al is made into this grotesque face, a mask, practically. He finishes putting the makeup on him, and Al walks up, there's a big mirror right over the mantle, and he looks at himself in the mirror, and as he looked at himself, a miracle took place. Not a transformation, a transmutation. His arms got longer, his back got, went up, he shriveled down. It was a miracle to watch it, for me. Hmm. I, I'll never forget it. And I realized I was in the, I'm, I'm in the presence of greatness. It's as simple as that. Long and short of it, Al and I decide not to go and do the film. Why? It's really a real B movie, because what happens in the movie, as you can predict, it happens in the man in the iron mask and all of them. And that is, he's going, the people who tormented him, who destroyed him, now that he's a great looking, he will get revenge on them. Mm. That's the third act. And he said, we gotta get him up with a better third act than that. It's too damn predictable. Mm. End of the movie for us. The last 20 years has watched a diminishment in terms of what I thought of as great cinema. True. Now, it isn't that good films are made. Scorsese's still making some. We have a rear guard, so to speak. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I believe it is a rear guard. I'm only putting that in the context of, you know, he made a brilliant film called The Irishman. And the only way he got it made is because Netflix did it. And because Netflix did it, their distribution is really the television screen. Well, he had to fight for it to be in a theater. Yeah. Yeah, that was a... Yeah, well, that was, but it was almost a, uh, you know, a compliment to him that they put it in. But it's not really, it wasn't in a theater. Didn't right. get that theater experience. Most people saw it, and I always say to people, I'd like you to tell me when the last time you saw some uh, a film on uh, your video screen, I don't care, how, on, your, on your screen, I don't care how big that screen is, Tell me, how many times did you get up to get a bite to eat, go to the bathroom, have an argument with somebody? And said, how many times did you actually sit through a film the way you would in a movie theater? It's rare. Yeah. Okay? If you have people that tell you, I, well, I saw the film, I saw, I saw it over a few nights. It's a different experience. Also, and I think it's so important, one of the things we maybe dreaded in a way and we look forward to it is screening the film for the first or second time for an audience. We made the film, and now it gets that cold light of day. You're going out to a theater, they recruit an audience you don't know where from. They're not your friends. And now you experience, but that's the first time you're really experiencing the film. And you'll see, for me, I see where the scenes should have cut already. They got it. Right. Get move move on, or and I, I won't go into it, but I've had things where something in a critical moment that I thought worked made the made the turn fell flat, and I asked if I could go back and reshoot it, and it was critical the reshooting of that scene. I never would have. To me, I loved what we had done. 
what we had done, I think, was original and everything. The audience didn't get it. Mm. I had to go back and do it in a more accessible way. Just that critical moment. That's what you get out of feedback. Okay? That's when people do, th when you get to Netflix and all the rest, they got themselves a subscriber audience. The level of things is up and down. It's just a different, a different standard. Ultimately, the feedback will determine what's made. If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, you can visit my blog where I post videos related to the subjects that I interview. Just go to moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. You can find this podcast at moviestilldawnpodcast.com, but we're also available on most of your favorite podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, TuneIn, Spotify, and YouTube. I would love to hear from you. If you're inspired to reach out, you can email me at moviestilldawnpodcast at gmail.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. And if you have a film geek in your life, or even just a mildly curious fan, spread the word that we're here. Thank you.